little bit of time for me to defog myself. It's one of the problems of wearing a mask and glasses. As well, what do we have for you today? We have um, a psalm for the new year, and we have a verse for the new year on a bookmark. Um, so more of that to come in a minute or two. But the psalm that David has just read to us is Psalm number 20. It's the first psalm. It's not the first psalm in the book of Psalms, of course, because it's number 90. And it's not even the first psalm in the book that we're going to be using in our house groups. Um, I think it comes towards the end. But it is the first psalm chronologically, or almost certainly, if you try and prove to me that it's not. It was written by Moses, or it was composed by Moses, and um, it is attributed to him. So there we are, that's what it says in the Bible. It says that it is a, a psalm of Moses, the man of God. Now you may know the history um, of, of when this, uh, of when this um, uh, psalm was composed. We'll move on to that. It was almost certainly composed when the Israelite nation was in the wilderness. Uh, you may remember the history. Moses sent Joshua and Caleb to spy out the land that God had promised to them. They reported back that the land was everything that God had promised to them, and that they should obey God's command and enter it and occupy it. But the Israelite people grumbled and rebelled, and said that it might be better for them if they were back as slaves in Egypt, because uh, they would rather do that than to face the, the powerful inhabitants and the battles that might well be necessary. And it was this rebellion that caused the Lord to be angry with them. And the Bible tells us that God's reaction was, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have performed? And Moses then defended these people before God, and in Numbers 14 we read, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them, as you have asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me, not one of them will ever see the land that I promised on oath to their ancestors. Not one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb was a different spirit, and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Uh, you might remember the little ditty that I think I have quoted before, that uh, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephani were the only two who ever went through to the land of Milk and Honey. All the rest died off in the wilderness. So it was, seems to be at this time that Moses composed the psalm. In modern terms, he was not in a good place. He was literally in the wilderness. And I thought that this was an appropriate psalm for this particular start of this particular year, because I thought several of us might be in that wilderness as well. We're not in a real wilderness, we're in a delightful part of the world, but we might well be in a metaphorical wilderness. The pandemic has caused all sorts of problems, and it has changed all for all sorts of lives in all sorts of ways. But just think about the, the situation that Moses was in. Moses had met with God in the burning bush in Midian, if you remember right in the early days of his life. He had seen uh, miracles, he had seen his staff become a snake and then turn back to his staff again. He had witnessed God's intervention in the plagues that were brought on Egypt in order to make Pharaoh change his mind. He had seen God's power in the crossing of the sea. He saw the wonders of God's wisdom in the provision of the Ten Commandments. And he had seen God's provision of manna in the wilderness. But he was not going to see this promised land. He was not going to go into the land of milk and honey because of the rebellion of his people. So this song was written from a bad place. And I, I thought that it was worth looking at, just simply because, as I say, because we're starting a year that we trust will be better than 2021, and we certainly hope that it's going to be better than 2020. But, of course, we may have problems in that year ourselves. So we ourselves are not in a 
particularly good place. Now the psalm uh, breaks itself down into three convenient parts. Always nice when the, when the preacher of, of a passage says, oh yes, there are three distinct parts of this psalm. And it starts with worship. So there we are, and the worship, and it all talks about the character of God. So we need, when we worship God, to understand what his character is like. And it starts, uh, as many of the Psalms do, with, uh, with talking about the character of God. And the Bible tells us that we should worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness and tremble before him all the earth. And it's good in our prayers to remind ourselves of who we're praying to or who we're worshiping. The world worships a whole variety of different gods, uh, both literal gods and metaphorical gods like wealth and fame. And it's good to remind ourselves that we are worshiping the only true God, and this is what Moses is doing here. God has been the dwelling place of his people for generations. There is little acknowledgement of this today um, as society strays further and further away from Christian teaching. But God has been faithful and he is the creating God. We change, but God doesn't. So not only has God been our dwelling place throughout all generations, but before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Isn't that an amazing start to an amazing psalm? You are God because you brought forth the whole world from, from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. So here are some of the attributes of God that we would do well to remember. Firstly, he is the God of security. Verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. If we look elsewhere in the Bible, uh, go to the New Testament and look at Paul, what Paul wrote to the uh, church in Ephesus, uh, he said uh, to them, and remember they were Gentiles like us, they weren't part of the Jewish nation, he said, consequently you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, and in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives in you by his spirit. So we're part of his building and we're part of his household. We are adopted children. Our inheritance is in Christ. We are secure in the knowledge that he will remember us. He won't remember our bad deeds, but our repentance and faith through Christ Jesus, he will remember. He is the God of security. He is also the God of certainty. Verse 2. Before the mountains were born, when you brought forth the whole world, from ever to everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If we go to the New Testament and we look at what to Christ said to his disciples as recorded in Matthew's Gospel, uh, Christ was, was telling his followers, Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So we have a certain dependable God. Even when he was living in Galilee, his followers would need constant reassurance. If you read any of the Gospels, uh, you, I'm often quite amused at the fact that they, the disciples didn't quite get things. They saw marvellous miracles and they listened to an amazing teaching and they didn't quite get it and they needed constant reassurance. And it's no wonder that we also need it as well. We are as needy as his followers were in those days. We can't see him, and we can't listen to his voice, and we can't witness the miracles that we read about in the Bible. So we need this reassurance that God is a God of certainty. We change, society changes, the world changes, unfortunately the climate changes, but God remains certain. He is also a God of 
sovereignty. From everlasting, this is verse 2, uh, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. After, uh, you know, again, let me refer to the part, to, to the New Testament, after Christ's death on the cross, his followers started to come under persecution. If you remember the, uh, what happened in the Acts, they started to get persecuted when they were setting up the church following Christ. And the Bible reports that they came together to pray. And so they were praying, uh, because they were coming under persecution, they didn't know quite what to do. And how did they start their prayer? Did they start their prayer, oh, oh help us, help us, we're in a bad situation. No, they started their prayer, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth and the sea and everything in them. So they were reminding themselves of who the God was that they were seeking uh, relief from. They were seeking the God to relieve them from the problems that they had. They were reminding themselves of God's sovereignty from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. And then uh, the fourth thing I think it is, he is a God of justice. He is, this is verse 5, he is a God to whom we are accountable. Verse 5, you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass in the morning. He is a God with whom we have to have a relationship. The Bible says that we will be accountable to God, either at our death or at his coming again, at his second coming. Paul writes again, we refer to the New Testament, Paul writes in Romans, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So we are all accountable to God, it doesn't matter whether we're following him, we are accountable to him. We have to give an account to him, and the Bible teaches that there is no escape from condemnation, apart from God's mercy through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. So that way, that's what we start off with. We start off with praise and we start off with the characteristics of God. We then move on to the next part, which is about us. The nature of mankind. So it goes on to talk about who we are and what our characteristics are. Well, the first one, won't surprise you too much to learn that you're mortal. The psalm reminds us where we are before God. In, in verse 3, he is able to say, return to your dust, you mortals. I always regard that as an amazingly poetic way of reminding us of what we are. Scientists tell us that we are 65% oxygen, 20% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen and the remainder of various other chemicals. Just that, um, they are material that we can get from a few bottles in the chemistry lab. When God removes life from us, we return back to that little pile of dust. The crematoriums would say a little pile of dust plus the odd pacemaker and artificial hip. But that's what we return to. That's what we go back to, a little pile of dust. Now, the Bible does remind us time and time again that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It, to me, it's utterly astounding that that little pile of dust can, um, what it can do. I find it incredible that our fragile bodies are capable of strength. That little pile of dust can be strong, it can be agile. It can endure, it can have amazing skills, we can have colossal thoughts, amazing thoughts, amazing imagination, art, music, and other creative skills. Um, if I just think about how parts of the human body work, the eye always amazes me. I mean, not very good eyesight, I always think the eye is an amazing uh, part of the body. And uh, many of you are understanding just how important the taste and smell are to us as well. How do they work? And we're just dust. Quite astonishing. And when life departs, we are but a pile of dust. But secondly, again, somewhat pessimistically, what does this uh, find us? We are sh 
short-lived. Verse 4, 1,000 years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. God is ageless and immortal, but we are not. Verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are like trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. See what I mean about this psalm being composed from a difficult place. The writer was not having a good time of it. But it's good to remind ourselves of these facts. The Bible implores us to respond to God and reminds us that we don't have much time in which to do it. Now is the appointed time, it tells us. Our lives are short-lived. And the other thing it tells us, the psalm tells us, about mankind is that we are culpable. This is probably one of the important points that mankind needs to learn uh, before they progress further in their walk with God. Moses sets this out very clearly. Our relationship with God doesn't start from a good place. We're not equals with God. We're not even in the same league as the God that we worship. Verse 7, we are consumed by your anger, we are terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Moses and his people had offended the Almighty God, so of course he didn't consider himself equal with God. But the world in general, if the world thinks at all of God, the world, the world in general would, would regard God as being a, a rather benign father figure, just looking for ways to bless us, I guess. Um, but that is not what the Bible is teaching and not what the psalm is saying. This is the most important point in our relationship with God, and it's vital to understand that we don't start from a level playing field, we don't start from a good place. Our lives may not be one of total decadence, we are not as bad as we, uh, as we could be, and our lives, may, uh, our lives may well contain wonderful actions and deeds, deeds of real kindness and grace and charm and delight, and perhaps our good deeds in many ways balance out our bad deeds as far as our human lives are concerned and the world is concerned, but that is not the way that God sees it. We're not right before God. He sees it uh, uh, that, that we are not right. Verse 7, he terrifies us with his indignation. So we don't start from a position of strength, but for, for, from the position of infinite weakness. So here is the, the, the gulf that we have between the Almighty God that we've been uh, introduced to in the first part of the psalm and us. God's expectations are infinitely high and our response is dismally low. Verse 11, if only we knew of the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. That's where we are as mortals. So let's move on to the third part our response to the year ahead and our prayer, what we should be praying for, for the year ahead. So here is the answer to the gulf that is between us and God. Here is the prayer that I think would be helpful to us, for us to make as we go into 2022. What should we be praying for? Verse 12, teach us to number our days that we gain a heart of wisdom. We should be praying for wisdom. The Bible makes constant mention of wisdom and its importance. What did Solomon pray for? He prayed for wisdom. What features greatly in Proverbs, read Proverbs and the, the word comes up constantly, wisdom. What does Moses pray for here? Wisdom. We're told that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't get me wrong, we can't live our lives entirely for our own wisdom. We should also be praying that the Holy Spirit should work in our lives, but we should also be praying for wisdom. James 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So as we are almost certain to be further affected by this pandemic in the year ahead, we will need lots of wisdom in taking decisions that are right for us, our children, our neighbours, and our general, uh, the general community in which we are. We need wisdom. But we also need mercy. Verse 13, relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. We should be praying for mercy, but we should, uh, uh, yes, we should be praying for this mercy. Uh, let me again refer to the New Testament, Titus. God saves us not because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. Okay, so that refers back to what I was saying before. It is not because of our righteousness that God looks on us and with favour. It's because of his mercy. And you also notice that in this passage, and in fact in the psalm, there's a level of impatience. The psalmist is in a bad place. Moses is in a bad place. And he is crying out to God. We had, uh, many years ago, I had a friend who, I guess probably he would describe it now, in fact, he wouldn't describe it now because unfortunately he was done. But uh, he would have described it in his later years as a nervous breakdown. He, he had a mental breakdown. And he found the Psalms extremely comforting because in many of the Psalms you have the Psalmist quite cross, pouring out his, his frustration to, the, to God. It, if you read all the Psalms, I, I, have, I, I have this habit of underlining it in my Bible. And, electronically in my new electronic one, but I always, I've always done that. Um, and there are several psalms that have no underlining in at all because they're really quite negative. But that could be of comfort to you if you're going through a bad time. But there are psalms there that are really, the psalmist is really upset and really uh, worried and anxious, and they are the psalms for you. So Moses wants God's mercy now. Uh, given the gulf that, that exists between God and mankind that we've been talking about, this should be our natural response. We should be praying for mercy. And then we should be praying also in verse 14 for satisfaction. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. The tone has changed, hasn't it, in this verse? The tone has changed. Satisfy us in the moment with your unfailing love. Moses recognizes this love that God has shown to him and his people over the years, and he wants that return, he wants satisfaction, and that he may sing for joy and be glad all our days. It's what we all want. As we know, the Roman stones ain't got one. But we all look for it, we look for satisfaction. And we crave love, and God has an unfailing supply. And what should be our response? We should sing with joy and be glad all our days. Now I printed out a few bookmarks with this verse on it. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. Nice little picture of uh, sunrise, uh, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Psalm 90. Verse 14. If you'd like one, there's a little pipe on the seat by Jill, and I'll try and make sure they're on the back. And I realise that reading books is rather old technology, and you might well only read on the pad, on, uh, on the tablets, and such like. If so, then stick it to your fridge or pin it on a notice board or somewhere if that's what you'd like to do. But it's a nice little reminder, isn't it, of the satisfaction that we pray for to God. God is satisfied. It, God is the only person who satisfies us truly, and we need his love every morning. And we also need a bit of singing for joy all our days. So stick it on your fridge, pin it your notice box, stick it in your book, and remind yourself that satisfaction, true satisfaction, 
comes from God and God alone. And then we also need for restoration. Make, verse 15, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. You can see Moses' thinking here. He and his people are not they're going to have many more years of trouble. They're going to die out in the wilderness. And he's asking for a balance of joy and gladness. The prayer here is for restoration to the love and grace of God. Verse 16, may your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. So the prayer here is that, that not only we, our generation, will be blessed, but the next generation as well. We've, we've got a, a good crowd of children here, and it's, uh, our prayer should be to them. Our prayer should be uh, to God for them, that God will bless them as well as this generation. We are so unworthy of divine assistance, yet so utterly insufficient. Without it, we need that restoration of God. Can give us. Okay. The next one we also should pray for, and this is the last one, which is blessing. Verse 17. May the favour of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us, yes, establish the work of our hands. So we're going to end on that blessing. May indeed the Lord eternal, the only wise God, help us to use wisely the fleeting time that we have on this earth to work for the glory of God in the little things as well as in the big things. So if we move on to the final slide. May the favour of the Lord, of, the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us, yes, establish the work of your, our hands. May our Lord favour lessons and establish the work of our hands. Amen. Thank you.